All right, this is week two of our three part series with Matt O'Kane. We're trying to make kind of cybersecurity interesting, to be honest. <laughs> We're trying to, we've got access to a man here with Matt who is often brought in to remediate uh, cybersecurity situations when they're looking real bad. So we want to, uh, we've got him here to share the stories with you that will help you understand what it looks like when it's going down, how you come back from a serious incident and the lessons that can be learned. If you want to know more about Matt, I suggest going back and looking at episode one that we did with him a week or so back. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to kick straight back into you, Matt, and we're going to go with another story. What do you want to tell us about uh, today or for this particular part of the episode? Well, I'm going to have to take you to a place that might be have some emotional pain. Okay. So I'm going to take you back to the the pandemic for a second, right? Okay. So we, I know we've all tried to blank this around yep. wine, but this is a really good example, and I think we can learn a lot from this story. Okay. So so there was a story of a a a, uh, a, a, a let's just say they were a well known brand in Australia. Just start like guessing until you tell me which one. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> joking. I will not do that. Sorry. Okay. And, and so what happened was. During the pandemic, we, we started a pandemic where everyone's working together and we're all in this together. Yeah. But, you know, that sort of broke down over time. <laughs> what? <laughs> Did it? <laughs> anyway, yeah. And there was a period where people are trying to do their best, right? So, mm. so you know, it was a, I, it's hard to believe it now, but there was a massive shortage of devices probably in March to about June of 2020. Mm -hmm. And so what a lot of IT teams were saying to uh, their staff was, Look, wherever you can get it, just go out to your local computer shop or Harvey uh, Norman. Yep. yep. And then if you can find a machine, just grab it. And that's what happened in this case. That it was a there was a marketing director. Ah, uh, marketers, they're the worst. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Marketing is awesome. I love marketing oh, people. Thanks. You know, like yeah. so 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 there's this marketing director and and she's bought a machine and she she's always wanted a Mac. So she's got a Mac and that's great. Mm -hmm. Um but because it was bought by her and taken back to her um, place, it didn't go through what a lot of companies would go through is set it up so they basically own the machine. Yep. So you, what you want to do if you're a company is you want to manage the machine. And that way you can stop bad software for a bit, or at least, at least software that you'd find undesirable installed on it. Yep. And it also stopped what happened next. So in this case, so the marketing manager gra uh, grabbed this machine, was using it, everyone's happy, but later on in that year, there was a breakdown in relationship between the CEO and the marketing manager. And that okay. happens, right? That's normal. Yeah. But what happened next was- um, they, <laughs> That's normal because <laughs> everyone ends up hating the marketing manager. So, uh oh. No, no, no. Look, look you know, <laughs> well, listen, Ross. I, I yeah. see a lot of stuff in workplaces, right? Workplaces, uh, you know, everyone's doing their best, but, you know, people, uh, you know, um, obviously in any human endeavor, there's obviously going to be some, some level of disagreement mm. or friction. And that disagreement can range from healthy. And it can go to the point when pe two people can't work with each other. Mm -hmm. And that's what happened here, right? right? And it's not unusual. This happens a million times a day throughout the world. Um, and, and, and that was a, that, that's what, so, um, the, the marketing person was, was dismissed and nothing happened for about nine months. Nine months later, the company got a tip that the information was being shopped around that was only known about by the company. And so people sometimes do this. You start, like, it's actually really interesting how often this happens for intellectual property theft cases. People go, I won't abide by that. And they'll then anonymously tip back the, the original victim company, oh. right? So that's what happened. Nine months later, they got a tip that this information was being shocked around. Ooh, okay. Now, the way it happens in Australia is you don't have this overt shopping around, right? It's, it's usually framed in um, terms like a signing bonus or like an extraordinarily higher pay for that role than you would ordinarily expect and a soft pressure put on the person to release some of this information. Yeah. So it's not, you know, in Australia, it's not, it's not like an overt transaction. Right? Yeah. Right. So, so there was this. Um, so there was this tip, and they wanted to know if there was anything to it. Because, you know, we need to be of generous mind. People sometimes misunderstand things. 
and we need to bring a generous mind to these kind of things. So they, they contacted me and they were like, how do we look into this? And so we've got a couple of barriers for this case. The first barrier is that when the marketing manager returned the machine after she was dismissed, it had been factory reset. Oh. Right. So we can't conduct any forensic examination on that machine. Okay. So if you have it locked to the company, that's something that's very difficult to do. Mm. Now you'll say to me, does that mean the machines get stolen from the backs of cars and garages and dropped into lakes by accident? Sure, it happens all the time, right? At, a, at, at amazingly convenient times. Right? <laughs> oh, <no. laughs> like, yeah. But you know, what you want to do is if you can if you control the machine, you can prevent users from doing these things. And if you need to examine it later, then you've got a fighting chance. Use backup or some sort as well, maybe? Well, see, this is what you could do if you manage your yeah, machine. Exactly. Right? Yeah, exactly. So yeah, yeah. If so, you manage the machine, then you get you can you yeah, can do that. Control. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, great, you know, the, the, the very best if evidence is backup. Imagine if we could wind the clock back mm. to the look time the of Delta. dismissal and look at it, right? Yeah, go, yeah. Okay, I, we can see what's happened here. Yeah. And quite often these 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 things turn out to be misunderstandings, right? Mm. Uh, but sometimes we find something in it. So we couldn't do that. The second thing we couldn't do was uh, we couldn't look at the Microsoft 365 logs. One of the things that we see, especially with small, medium businesses, is that if they get a license that doesn't give them 12 months of logging or two years of logging, then they have a very short window to detect problems. Right. Quite often, some of these logging windows can be seven days or 30 days. And logs solve these kind of questions. And so what you want to do as a lesson is, okay, you know, you've got a business owner that goes, well, I can pay $10 a week, $10 a month for my word. Why would I want to pay $70 a month or $80 a month? And the answer to that is you're not paying for a different Microsoft Word or a Microsoft Outlook. What you're paying for are all of these compliance services you get on the back end, right? right? Yeah. And what you want to do is normally for intellectual property theft cases, if you're relying on tip-offs, you don't usually get tipped off for maybe a couple of months, up to a year, the longest as I've seen, about a year and a bit. Yeah. And by then, how much has that data proliferated? How many people now have it? Exactly. Like, yeah. Exactly. You know. So, so is is a big problem here um, that people don't don't fully value their own intellectual property until it's starting to be up for grabs. Like I, I understand like, you know, uh, we, we've got some clients of our, of our own who are essentially creating something unique, whether it's uh, in the pharmaceutical industry, medical industry, industry, whatever, that's very clearly got an intellectual property element. That is their value. That is their secret source. Yep. But I imagine any business who has a database of clients, potential clients, you know, sales history, like that stuff has value in the hands of someone else, That's right? That's huge value. And is, and is it that people in business often don't just give it enough credence? I don't think that's the case. Sometimes we see the opposite. Okay. So we, we see people who are overzealous at guarding what could only be classed as fairly uh, standard procedures, right? Yeah. And we say, okay, look, you know, most of those procedures you can get written by ChatGPT quickly, right? Mm. What you want to guard is you want to guard what you were talking about, mm. the secret design, the, the, the list of when the contract renewals are coming up from my business to business customers, right? These are the kind of super valuable things. And the reason they're not sometimes guarded is because um, we, we, as business owners and business leaders, um, we're, we're, we're inherently optimistic people. Mm. And we're inherently believers in um, that that people are going to be trustworthy because a lot of us conduct ourselves in a trustworthy way. But when people come under pressure, um, you know, they, you know, I, I don't know, I don't know, I, I don't know what the common thread is, right? I don't think anyone intends to set out and do the wrong thing. But people can come under pressure. They get under financial pressure. They get under emotional stress. And then they behave in a way that if they reflected upon it, they would rather not have behaved that way, mm. right? You really do see people in a much more positive light than I do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, look, I think that if you're a business owner, you're a very optimistic person. And, and what we'd do is we'd prepare you and we'd say, okay, what can we do? So if, if something like this happens, we could detect it quickly or at least prevent it. Mm -hmm. And 
And then how do we then quickly investigate it? Because sometimes, you know, people uh, make, you know, they, they make us false assumptions. Like there was another case I looked at. There was a fellow who was a sales manager and he had a disagreement with his boss and I was asked to come in and investigate if he had stolen information. No, he didn't, right? There was no evidence of it. It was just the manager was, was just having maybe a tough couple of weeks. It was getting stressed. And maybe projected some of that stress onto onto the other person. Okay, but we we kind of answer those questions over time, right? Okay, yeah. So in the, in the case of this this um, marketing manager's laptop, it comes back, it's a brick, it's been completely re <laughs> factory reset. Yep. At that point, then okay, it's been shopped around. How do you know whether the information had ever been saved to an external source? Or like, what what do you do from there? You to can't do it. So the lesson from this one is, and this is what I teach some of my students in cyber resilience. Mm -hmm. um, is is I say, look, um, sometimes you just can't solve a case. Right? Sometimes preparation is the best way forward. A uh, uh, fence at the top of the cliff rather than ambulance at the bottom. <laughs> That's yeah. right. Okay. And so, so in this case, see, in, in in Australian legal sense, what you want to be able to do is ask for a court to give you permission to investigate this by potentially looking at their personal devices mm. or things like this. But if you don't have any evidence to start with, then that's very difficult to get. To yeah. Get <laughs> you kind of stuck with the old, mm, go on, kind of approach. And it's not going to happen. Judges don't love that. No. You know. Okay. Yeah. Right. So so in that case then, um, just out of interest, did, did there ever, like, was there any, like, they, they couldn't find out whether that person had uh, uh, willingly sold the data or, or, or it, whether that's just through taking more of a bonus or whatever. But was it ever found that anyone was using their data after the fact? Look, the re reality in this case was the last I checked in was mm -hmm. they weren't able to determine. Right, okay. And so the lesson here is if you can plan ahead a little bit yep. and say, okay, you know, what can I do to improve my logging? What can I do to improve my detection? Mm -hmm. You know, how do I – okay – I don't want to make it a a. You know, we're not spies. We 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 don't want to be in a workplace. <laughs> I'm sad every day. That that's not the case. Yeah. We want to work in a fun, open environment. That's how society should work. That's how we should work, right? Um, what can we do to put sensible controls around our most important data mm -hmm. and information, um, so we can get a bit of assurance and a bit of sleep at night, right? Rather than trying to, you know, we rather than trying to create Fort Knox. We don't. We, yeah, we you know. Yeah. You know, some workplaces need to have that, but mm. most we just want to have a bit of openness, but with a bit of protection. Yeah, and not to get too, uh, you know, techy or, or salesy on it, and I probably am not even using the right term, but actually Russell hates that. He always tells me to stop talking myself down. But, you know, <laughs> DLP when it comes to, to SharePoint, right, understanding how your information is being shared, what's being downloaded, et cetera, I think, it's, um, I think that that's massively important because, I, I mean, you want everyone to have access to exactly what they need to do their job well, to create great outcomes for their customers, to make your employees' lives just more fun at work. But you also need to know where it's going and yeah, and how it's how it's being used. So I mean that's kind of a I don't know, IP protection one oh one, I would think. I, I agree with you. I, I, I agree the DLP is really good. Mm. And for small medium businesses, especially ones who have grown a lot over lot sort of last decade or two. Yep. You probably want to do a bit of a search around the network mm. for pools of data. So people in your business with the best of intentions have retained information so they can get access to it. Yeah, right. But as a leadership team, you may not know where all of the pools of information are being held in your business. And there's other products to do that, or you can write custom scripts and we do those kind of things. Mm -hmm. But but the, the 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 that's like finding it I reckon good cybersecurity is having is just being organized. Mm. Right. So what are the assets you've got? Can you identify all the assets? And can you identify all the people who are supposed to be logged in or not? Right. Mm -hmm. And if you've got that 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 identify squared away, everything else becomes easier. Nice. Solid place to leave it. Stay there if you can. I will. That <laughs> I love it. That is the end of uh, episode number two. We're going to come back with Matt for one more. That's two. But one more stretch will be three stories. That's what I was trying to do there with the fingers. Uh Hopefully this is really helping you learn by understanding what it's like to to be at the center of one of these one of these cyber incidents uh, and learning from someone who is absolutely the right person to tell us what that's like in the moment. We're going to come back next week with a third and final scenario that Matt's going to share with us. We'll see you then.